Good morning. This is March 20th in the year 2000. This is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Program. And this morning we are privileged to have with us Mr. David Allen. Good morning, David, and Good glad morning. to have you with us. Do you mind if I begin by asking you your age? I am 77, last February the 12th. Lincoln's birthday. That's right. <laughs> and what is your current marital, marital status? Well, my wife died 15 years ago, day after Memorial Day of lung cancer, so I'm by myself, although I do have three boarders at the house. Do you have children? Yes, I have a stepson who lives up in Maine. I have a son who lives in Millis, and I have two daughters. Uh, Dorothy, the older one, is uh, 49, I believe, and she lives in Newton, and Judy, the younger one, I believe is about 40. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have grandchildren? Yes, I have. Uh, my, my daughter Dorothy had five daughters and one son, and the, Judy has one of each. My son is the black sheep. He's not married, but he's living with his girlfriend in Millis. If I had done 50 years ago what he's doing, my father would have shot me probably. Well, right. I'm, glad, I'm glad he didn't do that. Yeah, I'm glad he didn't either. <clears throat> Where were you born, David? Uh, actually, my folks were living in Wayland on Route 20, but I was born in the Waltham Hospital because it was closer for them to go to Waltham than either to Natick or Framingham. And two years after I was born, they moved uh, to Kachichuit. My father was principal of the high school in Wayland. And you live in Kachichuit now? I live in Kich have lived there all my life. The only time I did not live in Kachichuit was back in 1950. I got married to a girl from North Natick, and she had a house at the corner of Pine Street and Route 27. We lived there for five years until the, t the state, by eminent domain, took my house for the east-west toll road, and I had to buy it back from them for $500 and have it moved to Kachichuit, where it now is. So the turnpike took your house? By eminent domain, yeah. they were coming through my back door yard. Yeah. What was uh, Kachichuit like when you first moved there? Well, like I say, I was only two years old when I first moved there, so I, I really can't say except that I grew up there and I had to walk from my house, which was about a mile from the grammar school in Kachichwit, which is now housing for the elderly. It's that brick building right across the street from where Honey Farms is. And I used to walk down and walk home every day, and my brother the same way. He was a year and a half younger than I. But I went there from 1928 to 1936, at which time I graduated. So, see, in those days, you did not have a junior high or a high or a middle school, so you went eight years to grammar school and then you went to the high school in Wayland for four years. I graduated from Wayland High School in 1940. And believe it or not, this year, which is 2000, this coming May 28th at uh, the Wayside Inn, I'm having a 60th reunion for my class and I'm expecting about 20 people well wishes, husbands, wives, and so forth. How many people do you think were in our class when we graduated in 1940? I have no idea. 20. And all 20 are 20. going to jump to no. come to the... Four men and one woman, to my knowledge, have died. I couldn't get a hold of three or four people, so I don't know whether they're still living or not, but I do know that at least five have died. I expect seven people, five women and two men, Myself and Bruce Morrow, who lives out in Colorado Springs and is, well, he retired as a full colonel in the Air Force, and believe it or not, he wrote the Air Force manual. He was a very smart fellow. He went to MIT and, and took an aeronautics program there. He was in, actually as, as a, uh, a ground man uh, in, in the military and almost had his feet amputated because he, along with his outfit, had to stand in water uh, during the campaign over there. And uh, he said, uh, the doctor said if he hadn't 
gotten to them when he did, he would have lost his legs. He's got a lot to uh, yeah, remember like, about his but service. But anyway, he's living out there with his wife and uh, in Colorado Springs, and because of what he ended up being, a full colonel, he can get a Learjet out of there and come into Boston or New York and eventually get to us on May the 28th for that reunion. But he and I will be the only two men there. There will be five girls. Women. Women, right. So, I and hope they're you all, have They're all my age. In fact, I was the youngest one to graduate because my mother, because of my father's position as principal of the high school, got me into school at age five. The rest of them had to start at age six. So I ended up graduating at 17. I was going to ask you, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about your family, your mom well, and dad, what my they father did. was a tough old bird. You didn't cross him, but he was a very fair individual. If you were fair with him, he was fair with you. And you talk to any students, and there are still some around Kachichuan and Wayland still living, that loved that man. They called him Uncle Dave, but not to his face. But he, he uh, taught all the science and some of the higher math, along with being the principal. And you know, that man did things for that school that no other principal, to my knowledge, ever did. I can remember him going out on the athletic field before a football game and liming the field. I can remember him selling tickets to a football game, and I would be right there with him, of course. I, I went along with him to a football game over in Wayland, and there were places you had to cover where people had to come in, you know, to the football field. Uh, I can remember one story that was told me by the sister of a guy who actually was there. He used to take players in his Model A Ford to games, and one winter, they were going to a hockey game with about six guys in the car. And as they go around the bend, it was very icy. The car turns over. All they did was get out of the car, pick the car up, put it on its four wheels, and continue on. And that is a true story. I can believe it. It is. They made cars very well in those well, days. Well, I'll tell you another thing that he did that not many people knew about, but I saw it. After a football game, he would bring the jerseys home, and he and my mother, in the Apex washing machine, would wash those things and so they could be brought back and used the next week. Wayland had no money to pay for stuff like that. I do not know of any principal who ever did some of the things that he did. It was amazing, really. David, tell us, um, we want to get to your military career here. Uh, when and where did you enter the military? I was drafted out of Boston University. I had two and a half years in, in January of 1944, and I was drafted, and I had to go up to Fort Devens to be inducted, and from there they took us out to uh, uh, Illinois, where we took our basic training. You were in the Army? I was in the U.S. Army in the Medical Corps. Right. I was eventually in the 103rd General Hospital. And well, let's, let's take a step at a time go here. Go ahead. Uh, from Fort Devens, that was basic training for you? No, no. Fort Devens was the induction station. All right. And then we took our basic training at Camp Grant, Illinois. Tell us what you did there. Well, it was all basic training. That is, uh, they had exercises. I can remember one time where we were supposed to imitate uh, grenades, throwing grenades, and uh, they took us out on, well, hikes and stuff like that. And unfortunately, partway through that, I contracted pneumonia, and I was in the hospital for a few weeks, in which, at which time, my outfit went way ahead of me, mm -hmm. so that by the time I got out of the hospital, they put me into a program for, uh, well, to become a clerk, you know, like a clerk typist, which was great because at BU, of course, I, was, I, I had taken typing and filing and stuff like that. I was in a business program there, so this was natural. 
And it worked out good because when I got over to uh, England and we set up the hospital for about six months, I was like a ward man. They used to call us bedpan commandos. You, you laugh at that, but that's exactly okay. what you were doing. We're skipping ahead here, and I want to be sure that we get all we can. Well, um, go ahead. You ask the question. Okay. Did family or friends join the military when you did? Or did oh, you yeah. go in alone? As a matter no. of fact, I have at my house the Katichua Jeep, which was the uh, record of every man and woman who served in the Army, Navy, Marines and so forth, with a picture and a listing of what they did. And I have that at home, and believe it or not, since I got it, a lot of those men, and I, I, I should say women too, but I'm not aware if any have died, but I bet about 50% at least of those people in that book have since passed away. Yeah, did any of these friends go to basic training with you? No. Not you went there knowledge. by yourself. No. All right, and as I understand it, now you uh, became a clerk typist? Well, wh what I'm saying is for the first six months or so, I was in the, that is, I was uh, a ward man. Then about February of that following year, they instituted a rehabilitation program, and because I was the only one around who knew typing and stuff like that, I got the job under the officer in charge of the program. So then, instead of working seven to seven, then I was working nine to five, which gave me a chance to get into Salisbury, where All I right. had friends. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Other than um, courses that you might already have had in college, uh, what else did the Army train you to do? Well, like I say, uh, I missed a large part of the basic training being in the hospital. With pneumonia. With yeah. pneumonia, and yeah. that's why they, they sent me to clerk school for maybe eight or ten weeks, you know, after I got out of the hospital. Yeah. What did you like or dislike about uh, what you were learning? Well, I shouldn't say what I was learning. I, would, I should say the Army life. Uh, I didn't care the, for the regimentation. I mean, I'm not that type of person, but I mean, everything was cut and dried. They told you what to do. They told you when to get up in the morning, when to go to bed at night, and all day long they had activities. I mean, you had no choice. I, I didn't care much for the regimentation, if that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned a second ago that you uh, had gone to England. Did the military prepare you for the cultural differences you would be facing? No, no. I don't think anybody ever said anything about the English way of life or anything. You got over there, and after a while, I learned that the English people uh, really didn't care to have American soldiers over there. They, they felt we were overpaid, Oversexed and over sex here. and something else, I forget exactly. Over here. But yeah. I'll tell you, they, they didn't like us because we'd take out their English girls on dates and stuff. Uh, they felt that, that we were, you know, infringing on their life. And although I think we saved their bacon, really. How if, did you if, get to England? Oh, we went over on the West Point, which was a troop ship. And when we Came back a year later, we came back on the Queen Mary. The funny thing is, on the West Point, which is a much smaller ship, our colonel volunteered us for duty. We, we did the duty for the whole ship. I was in the bread room, and guess what we had to do before we could do anything? Get rid of the roaches. They were all over the place. We had to get rid of those, and the Navy man, who was in charge of, the, of that bread room. He didn't care, but I cared, and the other guy that was with me, there were two of us working with him. Hey, we, we can't work with all these beasts around, you know? So we had to fumigate the place and get rid of them. Where did you sail from, David? Boston. Out of Boston. Oh, yeah. I can remember us going from Camp Bragg, or Fort Bragg, east, and son of a gun, I said, this 
is where I live. And we went from Framingham, which is only six miles from where I live, down to, uh, I forget the camp. It, it was down south of Boston somewhere where we finally ended up and we had to get our processing. And I took this day, and I should have shown you this when I was at the house. In order to go to England, you had to have a Red Cross certificate with my fingerprints and my picture on it, and I've got it in my bedroom now. What, what, what purpose did that serve? It, it, it was your identification. You carried it with you. All troops that went to England yeah. had to be well, identified? Yeah, we, we did anyway. That's it was your identification. Did, when you left the States, did you know where you were going? No, they didn't tell us. All we knew was we were going to Europe, but we ended up landing at Bristol, and from there we had to take a train down to a little place uh, a half a mile from where our camp was. Actually, our camp was a British camp originally, but the British left it so dirty, it took us a week to clean up the place before we could use it as a hospital. Uh, Bristol's pretty far north. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's in, that's in, uh, our, uh, it's up on the Welsh border. Yeah, well, I was going to say in Wales, yeah. Uh, and like I say, from there we had to take a train down to, uh, well, the, the little town right next to us was called Ludgershall, if, if you're interested in, in knowing where we went. And in order to take a train from our camp anywhere, to London or, or wherever, you had to go to Ludgershall, and that's where the station was. And over in England, I don't know whether you know this or not, but because of all the goods and things that we gave England, they gave us one thing back called reverse lend-lease in that American servicemen could travel free of charge on their trains. And that is how I, I was able to go to many, many places, including a week uh, in the winter of 45, two other guys and I had a week furlough and we went to Scotland. We went mm -hmm. all over Scotland free of charge. David, it's important that we know the date. If I understand it, you went overseas about January of 45? No, no, I, I, I went, uh, you're talking about when I went yes. from the U.S. over? Yes. It was in July, the first week in July of 44. Of 44. Yeah, I, right. I, I was inducted in January of 44. Then we took our basic training, which took about six months. And then we, we actually left Boston, I think it was sometime in the first week of July, and we got over there uh, about a week later. It took us about a week to go over there, and of course we were hoping we wouldn't get torpedoed or something. My brother, who was in the Merchant Marines, he, during the war, I, I was over there, let's see, in uh, about May of, yeah, it was somewhere around May or, or the first part of June of 45. I happened to be up in London on detached service. They needed somebody that could type and send uh, or type out orders on offices going from the ETO over to the Pacific area. Believe it or not, my brother who was in the Merchant Marines at that time, got a, a, a trip over there and he showed up at my camp and I wasn't even there, I was in London. So then he went up to London and he showed up at my office one day and they gave me the rest of the day off to be with him. Okay, let's, let's yeah. stop a second here. Um, if we're up to the summer of 45. Uh, well, that, that was when I returned yeah. from England to the States. See, I was there from July of 44 to July of 45 in England. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the war ended? The war ended in May, uh, what was it, May 8th or May 7th or something like that. Yeah. And at that time. Where I, were you when the war ended? Well. I was just going to say, I had had a pass to Wales. I knew a family in Wales. In fact, this man was a miner, and he took me down 
into the mine where he worked. But that day that the war ended, I was traveling from Wales back to my camp, and I remember every town we went through, the people out dancing in the streets, they were so happy the war was over. They had gone through hell for about four or five years over there. I can tell you stories. I used to go into the PX, and I would get cig a cigarette ration. I never smoked, but the woman in Salisbury, the, the mother, Mrs. Carter, loved American cigarettes, and I'd give her my ration. I'd get candy, and I'd give it to her four boys. They used to love to see me come. No but kidding. was it like when you first got over there? You got over there in full war time. Well, we had we had a lot of work to do to clean up the camp to get ready to receive the wounded from the D-Day landings. Yeah. See, we got there you about got a there month later. You got there a month later. after D-Day. Yeah. Tell D -Day. us about that, the kind of work that you did. Well, like I say, for quite a few months I was a ward man, and uh, we had three departments. We had medical, surgical, and NP, which is, me which is mental. Okay, and I worked on a, a medical uh, part. Uh, the whole camp, uh, we had spiders, and a spider consisted of about six wards, you know, going out in different branches, like there would be a central location, and then there would be maybe six wards in that particular thing, and we had, like I say, three branches, medical, surgical, and NP. And then uh, the headquarters was down a little bit farther uh, away from where the wards were. And I used to have to work from 7 in the morning until 7 at night. Were you, is this with the uh, a 12 hour 103rd day. General Hospital? 103rd General Hospital. Okay, and tell yeah. us specifically what kind of work you did. Well, I mean, you took care of the patients, you took their temperatures, and you, uh, you gave them bars, and you know, it's just like you would in a hospital around here. I yeah. mean, any uh, medical person. I, I was back in December because I had an infection in this left leg. I was in Leonard Morse for 13 days, and the people there, uh, the nurses, I mean, that's, just, that's exactly the type of work I was doing. You have switched from being a, a clerk typist, as you no, described no, no, it. No, I, I originally was a ward man. It was only months later, back a, a, around February after I had been there for seven or eight months, that this opportunity, when they started the rehabilitation unit, yeah. came up. But up until then, from July, let's see, August, September, October, November, December, yeah, about seven months, I was a ward man. Right. That's, that almost suggests that you got some kind of medical training? Well, actually, what training do you need to put a, a thermometer in somebody's mouth or give them a bath or something? I, I mean, it was really ridiculous because most of the stuff we did in basic training was like the same type of thing any soldier would get. But like I say, being in the hospital, with pneumonia. I, I missed a lot of that stuff, but it didn't matter. Yeah. I, I don't think you really need much training to work in a hospital. You go and talk to some of these people that work up here in Leonard Morrison. Believe it or not, when I was there in December, I had about a half a dozen people who come from different countries, South America and Africa, and they come over here and they get jobs like that. And I don't think they have any specialized training, really. Mm -hmm. when, when you were working there, uh, were the patients Americans, all Americans? You're or? talking about in, 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 in my camp? Yes, sir. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, as far as I remember, they were Americans. I suppose there could have been some British, although I don't know exactly. I, I can't remember exactly. I, I would say that they were Americans. Yeah. And these were casualties from the fighting from, in Europe? From the fighting in Europe. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they would go to a field hospital, and then eventually, if they were bad enough, they'd come back to the general hospital. And then, if they were really bad, they, we'd ship them home. But sometimes, when they got through with us, they'd go back to their outfits. Yeah. yeah. Did you get to know any of these people well? 
Or no, did they not come really. And, come I mean, it was just a job to do. And then after you got through with your 12 hours, you went back to your barracks, and or you went to the mess hall and ate. Oh, another thing, I, I told you about bringing cigarettes. Yes. And and the candy. To Mrs. Carter. Another thing that they used to do once in a while, they would put a can, like this, of uh, uh, grapefruit juice or pineapple juice or orange juice on our mess hall table. A lot of the guys didn't care about them. Well, what I would do, get a box, put about eight of those cans in a box, and it was kind of heavy, but I would take it out, get on the bus, go into Salisbury, walk it up the hill, and these people had not seen any juice for years, and they, they loved that stuff. Do you feel your officers uh, gave gave you good support in the kind of work you oh, were yeah, doing at I this time? Oh yeah, I think so. Time? Well, our officers were doctors, yeah, and the nurses were lieutenants. Uh, the doctors usually were either lieutenant or captain, and our colonel, the one in you know the one in charge of our outfit, the uh, colonel Hiram Yellen. You might want to write that down, Hiram Yellen, Y E L L E N. He was a very short type of person. He was a real army man, and our sergeant and corporal were real army men. And uh, th yeah, th I would say they did a very good job, you know, training us and getting us right. I mean, all of us, we, we had two different types of ages. Either guys 20 and 21 like me, or guys 35 to 40 who, who got caught just because they were at the end of the, the age limit. Mm -hmm. But they were either young guys or old guys. Nobody in the middle? Hardly anybody, yeah. How do you explain that? I have no idea. I mean, hey, when they draft you, they draft you. You have no choice. You go, you know? <laughs> Did you run into anybody you knew from home when you were over there? Yeah, the funny thing is, I was in London one time in a Red Cross, and Billy Scotland, no, wait a minute. No, it wasn't Billy. It was uh, his brother, Bob. Bob Scotland from Kachichwit is in there, sitting there. And I said, Bob, what are you doing here? Well, he, he was like me. You know, you're looking for entertainment or to get a meal. I mean, the Red Cross were famous for serving us a meal. You know, I, I forget whether you paid 50 cents or a buck or something like that. But they, the Red Cross had places all over. I can remember going down to Bournemouth, which was on the coast, you know, just for a trip to get away from camp. And they had a Red Cross unit there. And everywhere you went, if you wanted uh, like a bunk or a bed or something like that, they would provide it for you. Yeah. And I, I know I've heard people say they charged for things, but my God, after all, they had to pay for the stuff themselves, so if they charged you a dime for a donut, who cared? David, how, how did you and your, um, your friends hear about the progress of the war, what was going on? Well, we, we could buy an English newspaper, you know. You, for instance, uh, you, you, when I went into Salisbury, I, I could go and buy a paper and, and see what was going on, sure. That Did was one way. To In fact, to, to this day, at home, I have a, a bunch of papers that I brought back with me when I came home. Did you talk to the British people about your work and what you were doing over well, there? Well, I, I knew this family in Salisbury, the Cardis, and he was an upper crust in that he owned his own plumbing and heating business, and he sent his boys to a private school, and one time he drove me up there to show me the school, yeah, they were very nice to me. I'll tell you, the English people couldn't have been any nicer. I mean, this particular family, at least. They used to take me down to their church, and I went to church with them, the Brown Street Baptist Church in Salisbury. And one of their boys, Peter, I took to a scout meeting one night. What was your rank at this time? I was only a private. For a long, long time, I was just, then I got a PFC. Then when I got back to the States, and I was working in a, well, it was the administrative office. I was like a bookkeeper. I kept records. Then finally, I ended up as a T-38 
four, I think it was, which was the equivalent of a sergeant, you know, in the regular army. But for a long time, it was just a private. Would you tell us again about that train ride when the war ended and the reaction of the people and what the, well, I guess I, what I was, about back I, at your own base, what was the reaction? Well, I, w I was traveling by train from Wales back to my camp near Ludgershall, and like I say, every town we went through, the people were out, they were so happy the war was ending, they were dancing in the streets, and really that's about all I remember. But I, I couldn't have been more impressed, they were so happy that the thing was finally over with. How did you feel about your own particular career then? Well, what do you mean by my career? My career was teaching. I was going to be a teacher. And I was two and a half years into it when I was drafted. Then I had to come back and I spent the first summer. See, I got out in May of 46. In those days, just because the war was over didn't mean a damn thing. You had to wait until you had a certain number of points to be discharged. I know. And I was down in Fort Bragg, North Carolina from about August or September of uh, 45 until I got enough points to get out in May of 46. Tell and us then what I you went, did at Fort Bragg. What did I do? Yeah. I, I was like a clerk. I was, I was in the administrative office, uh, I forget the, the outfit, but you see, when we came back from Europe, they broke our whole outfit up and everybody went different places, and I happened to go down, well, they sent me first to Camp Cybert, Alabama for about a couple of weeks. I don't know why that was, but then eventually they shipped me up to uh, Fort Bragg and I was there with the 82nd Airborne. Really? But, but yeah. that was not my outfit. They just happened to be there when I was there. But it, it was interesting. I, I used to be able to go to see a movie at night. Uh, I hardly ever got out of the camp because I didn't know anybody down there. The only time I remember getting out was <coughs> one weekend I got a pass because I had relatives in Augusta, Georgia. My father's sister was married to a college professor down there. In fact, he was in charge of the uh, chemistry department uh, at this college, uh, University of Georgia, I think it was. And I went down to visit them and stayed with them that weekend. That's about the only time I ever got out of camp to go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. You, you didn't tell us about the, your ride home, and I'd like to hear about that. You My, came over on the Queen Mary? I went over on the West Point, and yeah. I came back on the Queen Mary. Yeah. Did you sail out of Southampton? I can't remember just where we did sail from. You mean coming home? Yes, sir. I can't remember just where we did sail from, but it could have been Southampton. Tell us about being on that big ship. <laughs> I'll tell you, I didn't like it because I was seasick for about three days. It wasn't fun, I'll tell you that. I think the only reason I didn't get seasick coming over was because we were so busy working on the ship. But coming back, I can remember guys playing poker on the decks, and here I was for about three days, I was seasick. I, I can't imagine why I would get seasick on a big ship, but not on a little ship. But, but have, that, have you but ever that was exactly what happened. Have you ever gone to see it? To see what, the, the Queen ship. Mary? Yeah. No. In fact, I don't, I don't even know where it is now. It's out on the west coast. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. It's still there. You, no. you might find something where you carved well, your initials Well, I'll tell you, in something. my position here, being retired and having a leg like I've got and walking with a cane, I doubt if I'll ever get out there. I, frankly, I haven't got the money anyway. I, my son gets my teacher's retirement check to help pay for the taxes and the other things at the house. And because I worked for the Framingham Trust Company in the 50s, from 1951 to 1960, at a time when I couldn't find a job in the public sector. But that was good, because now I get almost $500 a month. The third of every month, I get a check 
for $493 because of working for them. And that's what I keep in my pocket and spend yep. for myself. While you were there, you have spoken several times about your uh, relationship with the Carter family in Salisbury. Yeah, when we first got Tell over there. Tell us about how you met those people. Yeah, when we first got over there, about a couple of weeks afterwards, this Mr. Carter in, in Salisbury called over to our chaplain and said, would you send a couple of American soldiers to have dinner with me the following Sunday? Well, I was friendly with Phil Dowdy, who was his assistant. So he and I went in there. And I was so taken by them, and they were so nice to us, that, like I say, I would go back whenever I had a chance to visit, and I'd bring them in the cigarettes and the candy and whatever. And Mr. Carter didn't care for me bringing his wife cigarettes. But, I mean, what was he going to say? Here they are, free of charge, and she loved those American cigarettes. Well, anyway, they would have me come in, and once in a while, if I had a 24-hour or 48-hour pass, they'd have me stay overnight. They had a spare room. And one time, I took their boy, Peter, to a scout meeting, and I was able to see what they did, because I was an assistant scoutmaster here before in Kitchitwood before I went in the Army. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because they don't call them Boy Scouts over there, they call them Boy Guides. I see. Yeah. Right near Salisbury is Stonehenge. Did you go I out went to there. visit that? Yes. As a matter of fact, I have probably in that scrapbook that you left in the car a picture of me and one of my buddies standing on one of the stones in Stonehenge. And today you can't do that because they've got the whole place surrounded mm -hmm. with a fence. But in those days, and during the war, of course, nobody's around. So we w just went ahead in, and we had somebody take a picture of us. And I've got it at home now. You were part of a very historic occasion, and that is being in Europe when the war ended. <laughs> right. Uh, was there any thought that you might be shipped out to the Pacific then? No, I don't think so, because uh, I think by that time, Harry Truman was pretty well uh, through with it, and when he dropped the bomb on Japan, that was it. Uh, you, you knew very well they weren't going to continue. And I got back in July of 45, and August was when the Japanese surrendered, so there was no time to mm -hmm. go over there. So that's pro probably partly why they sent me down to Fort Bragg. Can you look back on your career and think of uh, some memorable people or characters you might have met? Yeah, I'll tell you who I did see. Remember the guy who was at Bastogne who said nuts? McCullough. General McCullough. Yeah. And one day when I was on detached service in London, I was going up in an elevator and here's this little guy and I recognized him from his picture. General McCullough was one guy I didn't meet. Right. I never met Eisenhower or any of those other people, Patton, you know. But I was just up there for about uh, five or six weeks to do a job of typing. That was all. Can you give us the flavor of London in wartime? Yeah, a lot of it was bombed. I would go up there maybe on a 48-hour pass, and I would go out. The next day, and a building that was there the day before was gone. I mean, they had an awful lot of those, uh, what was it, V1, V2, those bombs the yes. Germans were yes. sending over. Oh, did yeah. You, did you see any of those? Well, no, I just saw the results, that's yeah. all. I mean, I don't recall. I think when I was at my camp, 80 miles west of London, they said one time that one of those bombs landed about, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe two or three miles from us. It, it evidently overshot London, but uh, there was an awful lot of bomb. It's a wonder they didn't, uh, they didn't bomb and destroy St. Paul's Cathedral, but for some reason that thing was never hit. It was amazing that 
that was saved, you know that. But a lot of a lot of London was bombed. Yeah, I mean, I I used to like to go up there j just to look around because I, you know, from my reading before I even went over to Europe, I I knew a lot of the places like, uh, oh, what is it, uh, the guy that that wrote. Uh, uh, the mystery stories, you know, what was his name? Can't help you. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the detective. Oh, I can't think of his name. And anyway, I mean, I got to to see that Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, Sherlock it? Holmes. Yeah. Right. I, like I said, I got I got to see that. I I got to see. Well, I I showed a barber two pictures. Remember, yes. of me with the tour. Uh, at uh, Buckingham Palace and then in front of uh, Big Ben. I've got two pictures at home, yeah? We, we took a tour one time, a whole bunch of American uh, servicemen. Can you tell us uh, in your career, which uh, took you to very interesting places, uh, was there a most memorable experience that you had I, I think going up to Scotland on that week furlough, I think that was as memorable. I, I have been to other places. I went to Dover and Folkestone when it was being bombed. I can remember staying at the Shalimar Hotel, and uh, I can remember seeing all these uh, sandbags they had all over the place, you know, to try and save the buildings. I went to uh, uh, Shakespeare's. Uh, home, uh, Stratford and Avon, on another tour, when a lot of my friends were going to pubs and sitting there all day long, I would take a trip somewhere. I went out to, uh, oh, what's the name of that place, named after a cheese, I can't think of it now, but I made a trip out there. Uh, I, but like, like I say, if I had a 24-hour pass, I'd go somewhere. I didn't go into a pub and sit there and drink all day long. If Scotland was one of the points Scotland you remembered, what happened on that Scotland was probably the highlight trip? because we had a whole week. And how far up into Scotland oh, did you go? We went by train from London to Edinburgh, over to Glasgow, up to Inverness, back to Aberdeen, and then home again. And we were on the go every minute. Yeah. Uh, I climbed uh, Arthur's Seat, which was a, like a small hill or, or a, a small mountain, really, outside of Edinburgh. I did that. I think my friends didn't want to go, so they did something else. Oh, I, I saw the castle in Edinburgh. Uh, uh, I forget the name. Oh, Princess Street is the main street in Edinburgh. Over in Glasgow, I ran into a relative of some people that I knew in Kachichwat, believe it or not. Uh, oh, we just went and went and went as much as we could, you know, to cover as much territory as we could. And I remember seeing Heather for the first time going along in the train. And of course, they sell Heather here at Stop and Shop where I do my grocery shopping. And I'm tempted sometime to buy some Heather. I haven't yet, but uh, that is pretty. It really is. You know, when you see a whole side of a hill with that stuff. At both Folkestone and Dover, you must have seen some results of the heavy bombing. Yeah, Can you a lot tell of us it. about that? Well, I don't know what there is to say. I mean, the, the buildings were damaged, and uh, it was right on the coast. And uh, I, I, I remember I had to take a train into London and then from London out to Dover and Folkestone. And I only had a couple of days, so it, I mean, I had to do it quick. And I forget just, oh, I think I must have stayed in Dover. That was it. I stayed in Dover and I went by bus probably over to Folkestone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and it's right there on the coast. I haven't asked you this in, in all that you saw and did. Uh, was there a humorous experience, something that you remember? A humorous experience out in wartime? Are you joking? Really? I mean, it, it wasn't humorous at all. It was pretty tragic. 
I mean, to see the people, and they had gone through so much before we got there. And of course, I was only there one year, but uh, I, I think that uh, there was very little humor in the whole business. I mean, you were there to, to defeat Hitler, and uh, that, was, that was it. Well, I, I don't remember anything funny about it. It wasn't funny. It, it was real stock, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. When and where were you discharged from the uh, services? Uh, I want to say Fort Bragg. Uh, chances are it was Fort Bragg, although uh, I think there was another place that was in there, but I don't remember what 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 you know what it was called. I, I'd have to say probably Fort Bragg. It's, that's where I spent a lot of time after I got back to the states. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Did you join the reserve or any no. veterans organizations after they you came wanted home? me when I was discharged to join the reserves and I said nothing doing I want to get back to BU and finish up and you know it was so lucky I did that because some of the guys I knew did join the reserves so what four or five years later they got grabbed for the Korean War yeah. and some of them never came home again. Did you ever join the American Legion or oh, yeah. any groups right like that? Right after I came back uh, in 1946, you won't believe this, but in Kachichuit, we started, 80 guys and myself started the VFW. And at that time, it was on the second floor of the fire station on Harrison Street. And then some years later, they tore that down and they built a new fire station down uh, near Finity's restaurant, where it is now. And eventually, the VFW bought a house over right off of, uh, oh, Old Connecticut Path. If you know where uh, the liquor store is, over there on Old Connecticut Path, it's right near there, on the opposite side of the street, and to this day, they are still operating, although I understand that because of the fact that a lot of the older guys have died off and because there is no war now, they have no new guys coming in. Eventually, the whole thing may fall apart. But I, my name is on the original charter, which is over there right this minute. Like I say, about 80 of us started and got a charter from the VFW. What were your feelings about coming home? Did you go directly to Boston University? Yeah, uh, I, got, I was discharged in May, and of course their, their school year ends somewhere around the middle of May, so I went right in and signed up for the summer program, and I took, oh, I forget whether it was two or three courses, which was the same as a half a year, and by the, the time September rolled around, I had completed three years, and then I went back, took the fourth year, graduated in 47, and I got a job done at Chatham High School, being the business teacher there, starting in September. And I had to buy a car. Well, when I was in the service, I sent a bond home every month, okay, $25 bond. I only made 50 bucks a month, but it didn't cost you anything because they gave you your food, they gave you your clothes and stuff, and I was never one to go out and splurge or spend a lot of money anyway. So by the time I got out, I had saved up 1,300 bucks, which bought me a Chevrolet. I bought a 1942 Chevrolet in 1947, and that took me down to Chatham where I taught school that year. Then the following year, I went back to BU and took a master's. And believe it or not, I was the graduate assistant to Dean Durrell at the School of Education, and that gave me a little extra pocket money for that job. I would work with his secretary uh, typing and stuff like that during the morning, and then I would take courses in the afternoon, and I wrote a thesis that year it was a tough deal because not many people 
wrote a thesis. What they would do is take a couple of extra courses, but I wrote the thesis and I still have a copy at my house. And uh, I forget what I was going to say now. I was asking you about your, your education. Did you uh, oh, use well, the GI well, uh, Bill to yeah, go to yeah. school? Yeah, well, like I say, when I came back, the whole thing, the rest of my undergraduate and all of my masters, and even after the masters, I got 30 hours beyond. All of it was paid under the GI Bill of Rights. You mentioned leg trouble before. I mentioned have, what? Having trouble with your leg. Did you injure your leg in the no, service? No, no, no. This, this happened about 20 years ago. I was on a camping trip with my wife out the other side of Worcester, and I went into the men's room this one night. And instead of going back the way I came in, I thought I'd be smart and cut through the woods. And I fell into a hole they had dug for piping for water. My, my right foot sheared off a pipe, and I thought I had, you know, minor damage. But they took x-rays and they found ligaments had pulled out. I had to go up to the University of Mass Medical Center, and Dr. LeClaire put those ligaments back in. My foot was in the cast for weeks. Then I had a walker for a while, and then I graduated to this cane. But he said, you better not drive. So for the past seven or eight years, I haven't driven. Did you get uh, any treatment at uh, VA hospitals for that? No, no, no. It, it, it wasn't service connected. I see. I want to ask you a, a, an overall question here. How important to you was serving in the military. Very important. If I had never gone in, I never would have seen England. I was very happy to be over there and seen that country to the extent that after I got back and I taught a year down at Chatham, on my own and with my own money, I went back. I stayed with the Carters for about a week and then I took a boat from Southampton to La Havre and on that train ride into Rouen, that was from La Havre. I took a train ride into Rouen. I met a fellow who lived, well, his folks lived outside of Paris, but he had an apartment in Paris. And he said, when you come back, you look me up and you can stay with me. So I took a, a, a bus ride all around France. I ended up just short of Italy I, I remember going into Monaco and going into the gaming tables there. I was in the French Alps uh, for a day or so. And then I took from Switzerland, I, I went up there to see, you know, what the glacier looked like. And from Switzerland, I took a, a train ride back into Paris. And I stayed for about a week with this fellow that I had met. And he used to take me after he got through work. And I remember going into, uh, uh, what is that thing they have in Paris, uh, the Eiffel Tower? Mm -hmm. I remember going in there on a, and one floor up they have a restaurant and we had strawberries and cream. I thought that was a big deal. <laughs> and uh, then he used to take me to different parts of Paris so I could see it at night, you know. And then I, after I stayed with him, I uh, took Let's see, I, I, went, uh, I went over to uh, Belgium and Amsterdam, and from Amsterdam I took a train up through western Germany, and I had an experience I'll never forget. I got on the train, I was in the third class compartment. This conductor comes back, he looks at me, <coughs> he says, you're an American. I said, yes come with me. And he took me into a first class compartment and I rode first class all the way up to Denmark. He said, we cannot do enough for you people. You saved us from the Germans. I'll never forget that. What nationality was he? He was, he was Dutch. Yeah, I, I, I took the train from Amsterdam over toward West Germany. And when he saw me, he had me yeah. go into this first class compartment and I rode first class the rest of the way. That's a very good story, David. Really? 
David, what did you think then, and what did you, what do you think now, about the particular war you served in? Well, we we felt it was worthwhile. I mean, I feel sorry for the Vietnam people who went over there, and oh, fifty thousand of them died. And when they came back home, nobody cared anything about them. You know, it's ridiculous because they did just as much, if not more. Now, for instance, I would hate to have had to go to a place like the South Pacific or Vietnam where they got all kinds of diseases. At least I was in a place that was civilized, you know. But a, a lot of these guys went through hell. And, and when they got home, the people didn't appreciate it at all. Is there any one thought or memory that you would like to share with us or your family who are going to view this tape? I, I would say at the time I felt, uh, that is when I was taken out of BU, at the time I felt, what are they after me for? You know, what can I do? But after I went through the basic training, which wasn't too good, believe me, I mean, I don't think any soldier or Marine who has to go through basic training thinks it's a, it's a bowl of cherries. But after that, and go, especially being able to have the opportunity to go to England and see the people and take part in what I thought was something worthwhile. That's what I felt. It was worthwhile. Then, after two and a half years, I got back and I continued with my life. Thank you, David. Thank you very okay. much. You appreciate it. It's been an experience. And thank you for the coffee. <laughs>